Hello. Uh, good morning, Sridhar. Good morning, Hello. sir. Uh, thanks for uh, joining the class. Please uh, message others also. I have sent the link. Uh, okay. Uh, please inform them okay. to quickly join the class. Can you do that, please? Yes, sir. Thank you. So, are you able to see the screen? No, sir. No, sir. Now you are able to see the screen? See that? Now you are able to see the screen? Hello. Hello. Hello, are you there? Yes, sir. Sade Kumar? Yes, sir. Right? Okay. Yes, sir. You are able to see the screen? Yes, sir. So I of questions and answers. After the class, I'll be sharing uh, this material, and uh, I'll be having uh, two more sets of uh, sample of questions and answers solved. And uh, that also I'll be sharing with you after the class. Today, if I complete uh, this entire material, uh, then I'll be able to share this. So in the last class, we discussed uh, some of the things, right? So like uh, password sniffing, uh, for question number one, where we have listed out some of the important uh, uh, and uncommon attacks like salami attack data diddling uh, these things and also 
uh, famous attacks with respect to the mobile computing. These things we discussed in the last class, plus uh, layers of OS reference model on which the basic firewall types works. That is also given here, plus the answers for the firewall types, especially the packet filters and stateful firewalls and stateless firewalls uh, were also discussed in the last class. Well, uh, while we have discussed many of the topics, still we have some more topics uh, to be discussed today. There is one question. You explain network address translation. Uh, you should know that this uh, network address translation is part of the firewall, which, uh, okay. And suppose there are, there is a question here, explain network address translation and its types. Suppose there are 3,000 devices who need access to internet, suggest what type of NAT is suitable. Friends, uh, we know that network address translation, right? So if you want to have a private IP address uh, to a public IP address, then you'll be using network address translation, where private IP address is generally not registered. Therefore, in order to have a communication with the public network, public IP address is required. The process of converting mapping public IP address, private IP address to a public IP address is done by network address translation. In this process, one or more local IP address is translated into one or more global IP addresses. And vice versa is also important because when you want to have a communication with the public IP address from a packet, from a public IP, uh, public uh, uh, network to private network, that is your network, when it's willing to enter, it needs to have a, the reverse of it, that is uh, mapping the global IP address with the private IP address, that's also important. In fact, both process are uh, converting from private IP address to the public IP address and vice versa, that is public private IP address is done by the NAT and uh, generally operators on routers are firewalls. Network address translation was seen just it is a quick look at the network address translation. The generally broader router is configured for NAT. Broader router means uh, a, you have a network, assume a cloud where you are having a different uh, net routers representing a particular network. One router which connects to the another net, sub network you may call it as a border router, which is configured for a network address translation. That is to convert from the private, private IP address to a public IP address. All right. A router which have one interface in local network and one interface in global network. So that is required for the communication. When a packet travels outside the local network, then NAT converts the local IP address to a global IP address. When a packet enters the local network, the global IP address is connected to the local uh, or private IP address. You know that. The question also asks you to explain network address translation types. There are three you configure the NAT. Static NAT, right? Uh, first one is static. IP address is mapped with a legally registered IP address. That is one-to-one -one mapping between local and global addresses. Please remember, static NAT is one-to-one. -one. one private IP address gets mapped to one and only one legally registered public IP address. That is one-to-one -one mapping between local and global address. This is generally used, used for web hosting. There are, mm, these are not used in organization as there are many devices who will need internet access and to provide internet access, right? Then a large number of uh, uh, IP addresses are required. IP addresses are uh, 
having some limitations with respect to IPv4, that is the, um, with respect to 2 to the power of 32 IP addresses uh, you can have in 32-bit addressing scheme, in 64-bit addressing scheme, um, that is uh, rectified to some extent, we'll be having different schemes to overcome the problems of the IP address space, but still IP address is costly. We cannot have 3000 IP addresses. Suppose if a, an organization wants to connect 3000 devices to the public network. Therefore, static NAT scheme in such cases are not recommended. Suppose if there are 3000 devices who need access to internet, the organization has to buy 3000 public addresses that will be very costly. So that is not advised. Let us look at, so in network address translation types, uh, we will look at static, dynamic, and one more type. And in the first, we can understand that if you are having a large organization or any organization which has having more number of devices to get connected to the public IP address, that is the common case now. In that cases, static NAT is not suitable. Let's see what dynamic NAT is and whether dynamic NAT is suitable. In this type of NAT, an unregistered IP address is translated into IP address, registered public IP address. Private IP addresses are always referred as unregistered IP address and a private network will be having more number of devices and hence more number of private unregistered IP addresses. So, an uh, unregistered IP address is translated into a registered IP address from a pool of public IP address. If the IP address of pool are not free, then the package will be dropped as only fixed number of IP address can be translated to public addresses. Pause. If there is pool of two public IP addresses, then only two private IP addresses can be translated at a given time. If third private, the packet will be dropped. Therefore, many private, private IP addresses are mapped to a pool of public IP addresses. In dynamic NAT, we use multiple private unregistered IP addresses mapping to one single public NAT set of multiple. I am calling, I am using the word set. That means you don't have IP addresses. So, a set of private unregistered IP addresses, which are many, are mapped to a pool of public IP addresses. That is, NAT is used when a number of users who wants to access the internet are fixed. Very costly as the organization have to buy many global IP addresses to make a pool. Okay, so mm, this is with respect to the dynamic NAT. Port address translation, you have PAT. Neon think that PAT is different and NAT is different. This is also known as NAT overload. In this, many local IP addresses can be translated to a single registered IP address. So, when dynamic NAT is costly and when you are having organization to connect to a public IP address, and as asked in the questions, 3,000 devices are there which wants to connect to the public IP address, then you need to have extension of dynamic NAT called PAT, which converts many local private IP addresses into a single register IP address. Port numbers are used to distinguish the traffic, but which traffic belongs to which IP address. This most frequently used as it's cost effective as thousands of users can be connected to the internet by using only one 
real global public IP address. So I think we have answered the question. Question is, what is uh, what what is the NAT or uh, what are the types of NAT? So static, dynamic, and PAT. These three, and also the question expects you to suggest which network address translation need to be implemented when organization has got many devices to connect. So that is one. We also discussed uh, in our topic virtual private networks and here there is a question. Think of a situation where corporate office of a bank is situated in Washington. I, I remember I have discussed the same uh, questions and uh, you may expect such questions in your main examination or in your internal test. What are virtual private network? Think of a situation where corporate office of a bank is situated in Washington, USA. Right? I'm describing the problem. Think of a situation where corporate office of a bank is situated in Washington, USA. This office has a local network consisting of say 100 computers. Suppose uh, other branches of the bank are in Mumbai, India and Tokyo, Japan. Suggest how do you connect them by reducing costs and present the architecture for the same. Okay, so it is time to recall what is a virtual private network. VPN stands for virtual private network. A virtual private network is a technology, right, that creates safe and encrypted connection over a less secure network, such as the internet. So when you when your private network wants to connect to another branch of your own or another, of another organization, what through your public network, then you will be having virtual private network that creates a safe and encrypted connection or a less secure network such as the internet. Virtual private network is a way to extend private network using a public network such as internet. As the name itself suggests that it is virtual private network that is user can be part of local network sitting at a remote location. It makes use of tunneling protocols to establish a secure connection. Let's uh, think of a situation as given in this problem, right? In this problem, they said there is a corporate office in Washington and the office has local network consisting of say 100 computers. Suppose other branch of the bank are in Mumbai, India and Tokyo, Japan. How do you connect them by reducing the cost? So the problem is clear. The situation of the problem can be described as follows. All 100 computers of corporate office at Washington are connected to the virtual private network server, which is a well-configured server containing a public IP address and a switch to connect all computers present in the local network that is in US head office. The person sitting in the Mumbai office connects to the virtual private network server using dial up window and virtual private network server returns an IP address which belongs to the series of IP addresses belonging to local network of corporate office. Thus, person from Mumbai branch becomes local to the head office and information can be shared securely over the public internet. So this is the intuitive way of extending local network even across the geographical borders of the country. Right? So the architecture is shown in this. I, I have already shared this architecture. In fact, Whatever the discussions uh, 
that we have made on our, on our regular class is taken here and uh, I have given the questions and answers. Still, you can refer to it. And this is uh, a material prepared for myself and uh, in order to help you to study uh, because of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic lockdown, many of the students, uh, if uh, given as an assignment, may not be able to do it. That's why I have done from my side and I'll be sharing with you. But however, uh, after sharing all PPTs and um, all materials, uh, I am planning to conduct one open book uh, which enables you to uh, go through the entire material and the syllabus. That definitely helps you to write the examination. Okay, just go through this architecture. The next question is, what is the difference between IDS and IPS? Intrusion detection system and intrusion prevention system, as per the syllabus, we have seen not as both IDS and IPS. The question is, what is the difference between the two? And with re reference to SNART, IDS or IPS, analyze the following operating system, fingerprinting attempts, semantic URL attacks. Okay. As we have seen, you can also search uh, its uh, information is available. You have to remember that SNORT SNORT is a free open source network intrusion detection system created in 1998 by Martin Rost, former founder and CTO of Sourcefire. SNORT is now developed by Cisco, which purchased Sourcefire in 2013, at which Rost is a chief security architect. More information is available on Wikipedia. And SNORT IDS is developed in C programming language. Original author is Martin Rose, developed by Cisco system. Okay. This is with respect to the SNORT. SNORT's open source network based on intrusion detection system. SNORT's open source network based on intrusion detection system, IDS, has the ability to perform real-time traffic analysis and packet logging on internet protocol networks. SNORT performs protocol analysis, content searching, and matching. The program can also be used to detect probes or attacks, including but not limited to operating system fingerprinting attempts, semantic URL attacks, buffer overflows, server message block probes, and still core scans. Operating system fingerprinting. What is this operator's operating system fingerprinting is? It is the process of learning what operating system is running on a particular device. By analyzing certain protocol flags, options, and data in the packets, a device sends onto the network. We can make relatively accurate guesses about OS that sends these packets. Without actually going to a particular system, in which operating system is installed by looking at the flags of the packet it is possible to predict what operating system is sending these types of packet that is called operator system fingerprinting in a semantic url attack now i am coming to the semantic url attack in this type of attack a client manually adjust the parameters of its request by maintaining the URL's syntax but altering its semantic meaning. This attack is primarily used against CGI-driven websites. A similar attack involving web browser cookies is commonly referred to as cookie poisoning. 
in computer networking server message block called ASMB, one version of which was also known as Common Internet File System. CIFS operates as an application layer network protocol, mainly used for providing shared access to files, printers, and serial ports, and miscellaneous communication between nodes on a network. Right? So this is uh, with respect to IDS uh, and IPS. Explain briefly the following by highlight whether they are open source software, their functions, the kinds of attack, security technique as applicable. Okay. Backtrack Linux, Mac port, Sysmin and SSH. So they may ask you to explain what is a backtrack in brief. Backports, Sysbin and SSH. Backtrack is now Kali Linux since 2013. Backtrack was a Linux distribution that focused on security. Based on the Nopex uh, Linux distribution aimed at digital forensics and penetration testing use. A penetration test, you know, right? Colloquially known as pen test is an authorized simulated attack on a computer system performed to evaluate the security of the system. The test is performed to identify both weaknesses, also referred to as vulnerabilities, including the potential for unauthorized parties to gain access to the system's features and data as well as strengths, enabling a full risk assessment to be completed. That is with respect to the penetration test. Brief one, brief information is enough. Mac ports, formerly called Darwin ports, is a package management system that simplifies the installation of the software on the Mac OS and Darwin operating system. It's an open source software project to simplify installation of other open source software. Similar in aim and function to Fink and BSD sports collections. Darwin port was started in 2002 as part of the Open Darwin project with the involvement of a number of Apple Inc. employees including London Fuller, Kevin, and Jordan Hubbard. Mac ports are also called Darwin ports and all these things we have seen. We will go to the size bin. Friends, here you are not uh, uh, asked to write pages together and you will be writing a briefly on it. Suppose if you want some more information, always available in the regular class uh, by referring to the different uh, questions, papers, and other things. I, I think uh, this information is enough as per your scope of the syllabus. SizeBin is a POSIX compatible environment that runs natively on Microsoft Windows. Its goal is to allow program of Unix-like systems to be recompiled and run natively on Windows with the minimal source code modifications by providing them with the same underlining POSIX API they would expect in those systems. It's possible to launch Windows applications from the SizeWin environment as well as to use tools and applications with the following operating context. Right? So, can anybody explain what is a POSIX API? 
Hello? Can you just uh, expand what is uh, POSIX? The Portable Operating System Interface, POSIX stands for the Portable Operating System Interface, which is a family of standards specified by the IEEE Computer Society for maintaining compatibility between operating systems. So if you go to some websites like Wikipedia, you'll get more information with respect to the POSIX. Next is a SSH protocol. SSH protocol, it is referred to as a secure shell, which is a method for secure remote login from one computer to another. It provides several alternative options for strong authentication and it protects the communications security and integrity with strong encryption. It's a secure alternative to the non-protected login protocols and insecure file transfer methods such as FTP. You may ask or you may be asked to explain how SSH protocol works. How does the SSH protocol work is the question. The protocol works in the client server model, which means that connection is established by the SSH client connecting to the SSH server. The SSH client drives the connection setup process and uses public key cryptography to verify the identity of the SSH server. After the setup phase, the SSH protocol uses strong symmetric encryption and hashing algorithm to ensure privacy and integrity of the data that is exchanged between client and server. I repeat, SSH protocol works on client server model. Connection is established by the SSH client connecting to the SSH server. The SSH client drives the connection setup process and uses public key cryptography to verify the identity of the SSH server. After the setup phase, the SSH protocol uses strong symmetric encryption and hashing algorithm to ensure the privacy and the integrity of the data. This is exchanged between the client and server. There may be some general questions uh, which may help you in understanding the subject. They may ask these types of questions. You know, as per the IT Act, certain uh, softwares which really affect the society and Influences badly, we can be banned at any point of time. In our, in our class, we had discussed some games like PUBG games, which is actually developed by China, such cases and its impact on the society we had discussed when we had daily classes. Today, we have a question how internet games such as Blue Whale influence the netizens, under what sections of IT Act or IPC such games can be banned, propose the IT solution to control such illegal games. In fact, uh, 
I had given this as an assignment and I had given you some of the websites to see what are the different types of IT solutions provide. Tuka reduce internet addictions. Now, let us try to answer this question and you can also further improve the answers. This is only a reference material. If, you can, if such questions are asked, you have to or write the answers. Low self-esteem. So how the internet games influences low self-esteem. What happens? Disconnecting with friends, wanting to be alone, with withdrawal from family members, reluctance to leave their electronic gadgets unattended, avoiding school or work, changes in uh, personality, that is anger, sadness, crying, drastic changes in appearance or weight, fresh marks on the skin or wearing clothes that hide these marks even in summers are some of the signs that may help a caregiver, friend or family member to identify a need for help. In such cases, it becomes important to make the person feel that help is available without judgment. Encouraging, expressing one's feeling either in spoken words, a lecture or general help in releasing these amped up emotions. We must convince such teenagers that their pain is understood, that they are brave, that we respect them for whom they are and what they have done, nothing wrong. Over 4,000 children are said to be have committed suicide due to this dangerous game worldwide. There were reports that a 14-year-old boy recently ended his life in Mumbai due to the influence of Blue Whale game. It has now arrived in our state also. His The legislator also said many countries had already banned this computer game and wanted the state government to take necessary steps to regulate. District police in Kolam, Kerala had launched a campaign against the game. Abraham said adding a coordinated effort of school and college management, police and organization is needed to safeguard children from the influence by the internet game. Blue Whale Game, also known as Blue Whale Challenge, is an internet game allegedly comprising a series of tasks assigned to players by administrators during a 50-day period, with the final challenge requiring the player to commit suicide. There is no specific statute in India relating to the regulation of video games, either in the matters of obscenity or violence. There has been not been any decided and reportable court cases wherein the video game industry was involved. Parents, teachers, and caregivers must understand that once we help them in the real world to reduce these games, they are less likely to fall prey to such crimes online. They will then have the strength to say no, stand up for themselves, identify and report abuse, not only in the physical world, but also in the virtual world. There has to be a more active role that each one of us needs to play in spreading awareness about how to combat 
these crimes and protect ourselves and our loved ones. Primarily, following legislations will be applicable on online games, computer games, gaming consoles and video games industry. Constitution of India, Article 19.2 and 39F, Indian Penal Code 1860 IPC, Sections 292 and 293, Indecent Representation of the Woman, Information Technology Act 2000, the Young Persons Act 1956, all these things talks indirectly about the banning of games. The next question is, what are bots explain any two crimes due to bots and proposed strategy to control along with IT solution? Friends, we have seen what is a bot, a botnet, about that you had a multiple choice question also. A bot is an automated trader. In general, it is an automated software that can do many things. If it is an automated trader, that it can buy and sell automatically the shares, for example. Usually in the shorter market because bots are pre-programmed, buying and selling without emotions when certain triggers happens. They are historically responsible for dramatic market crashes. The famous 1987 Black Friday Wall Street crash where equities dropped over 30% in one day was caused by program trading. The first generation of bots which sold stocks automatically when they fell below a certain price. Today bots have become ubiquitous and are certainly not limited to the equities market. In the equities world some bots known as frequency traders are in fact welcomed because they provide liquidity to normal buyers and sellers of the equities. But in the cryptocurrency world, not all bots are created equal and many are not there to help you. We have to keep the bots under control as artificial intelligence software robots or bots become faster learners and better at mimicking human behavior. Bots, botnet crimes may be controlled by implementing <laughs> strategies at the corresponding layers. For example, a tool may be implemented to keep investigating bandwidth stealing and leasing which work at physical data link layer. The question number eight about the Bitcoin ATM. Based on the cyber crimes and cyber loss, a question may be asked even though the Bitcoin is not in your syllabus. Bitcoin is a widely used term. So at least the ABCD of Bitcoin you should know. A Bitcoin ATM is a KISOG that allows a person to exchange Bitcoin and cash. Some Bitcoin ATMs offer bidirectional functionality enabling both the purchase of the Bitcoin as well as the sale of Bitcoin for cash. In some cases, Bitcoin ATM provides require users to have an existing account to transact on the machine. Bitcoin machines are not ATMs in the traditional sense and probably use the wording ATM as a Nilogsium. Bitcoin QSOCs are machines which are connected to the internet, allowing insertions of cash in exchange for Bitcoins given as a paper receipt or by moving money to a public key on the blockchain. They look like traditional ATMs, but Bitcoin QSOCs do not connect to a bank account and instead connect the 
user directly to a Bitcoin exchange. According to an advisory issued by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, they may also charge high transaction files. Fees. Media reports describe transaction fees as high as 7% and exchange rate $1.50 over rights you could get elsewhere. In India, on October 24, 2018, a case happened in Bangalore. A 37-year-old man was arrested on Tuesday, October 24, for earning ATM Bitcoin as reported in Times of India and Vijay Karnataka newspapers. So, given this information, you may be asked to answer the following questions, discuss whether the Bitcoin is legal or illegal in India, what is the stand of USA, what are the directions of RBI and Supreme Court in this connection, what is the financial burden on customers, what are the types of attack possible on Bitcoin and what are their adverse effects. Friends, you need not only stick on to these answers. Answers given are the examples here. You can refer to the different websites and improve the updated answers. One question discuss whether it is legal or illegal in India. In early 2018, India's Central Bank, the Reserve Bank of India, announced a ban on the sale of sale or purchase of the cryptocurrency. Absolute ban as of 7th April 2018. State Bank of Pakistan has announced that Bitcoin and their virtual currencies, tokens, kinds are banned in Pakistan also. But recently, as per the Supreme Court statement, as per my knowledge, in 2020, again, Bitcoins or big cryptocurrencies are made legal in India. So, you should uh, re keep referring to the latest news and happenings to answer some questions in the cyber security. Bitcoin rupees 2000 crore fraud. So, Bitcoin is uh, once we allow that, we should have been equipped with uh, the corresponding technology if some problem happens that preparedness is required so it so please uh, refer to uh, some fraud note down this bitcoin rupees 2000 crore fraud amit bharat was arrested at delhi airport for cheating uh, 8000 people just see this what is this uh, case in the major setback to the people who are investing their hard earned money in cryptocurrency specifically in bitcoin a bitcoin fraudster has been arrested amit bharadwaj the author of cryptocurrency for beginners has been arrested by pune police at delhi airport in the major setback to the people who are investing their hard earned money in cryptocurrency exchange specifically in Bitcoin, in expectation of multifold return of the sum. A Bitcoin fraudster has been arrested, as I have explained to you. According to Indian Express report, Amit Bharaj was treated as a Bitcoin entrepreneur due to more than 8,000 people to the tune of rupees 2,000 crore from access. The country was, okay, as I was arrested at Delhi airport. Amit Bharadwaj had incorporated a multi-level marketing scam by luring investors to offer him bitcoins in lieu of higher returns. Amit Bharadwaj introduced a contract valid for 18 months which offering a return of 10%. Amit Bharadwaj also promised to facilitate the Bitcoin mining hardware to the investors, which the investors can mine their own Bitcoins. This is as per the Indian Express. Bitcoin regulations uh, in India, although RBI advises the caution on its use, Bitcoin is not 
legal in India as of 2017 and 18 now it's uh, legal as I told you. In USA, Bitcoins are uh, being used in this country. The central bank announced Bitcoin cryptocurrencies are not considered as currencies and are not backed by the government nor laws. However, they are not illegal in USA. These are few merchants who do accept Bitcoins in the country. Okay, so these are the, some of the questions. Uh, you can uh, further think of answering uh, these questions or improving these uh, answers. I think uh, whatever I have discussed uh, is uh, enough. We'll stop the class uh, at this stage. So please refer to this material. It will help you. Whatever I am giving you here will be sufficient for your examination. And uh, myself, I have prepared this keeping uh, some perspective which will help you once the examination is completed you will come to know however I request all of you to sincerely attend all the classes and follow the instructions given by me which enables you to succeed in your examination also in your career I uh, thank uh, all of you for attending the, the class you can uh, rejoin this class tomorrow at second hour, 9.30 to 10.30. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, sir.